All right, uh, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with the um, hymn of the month, Speak, O Lord, Your Servant Listens. <laughs> Speak, O Lord, your servant listens. Let your word to me come near. Newborn life and spirit give me. Let each promise still my fear. Desperate power its inward strife. Was against your word of life. Fill me, Lord, with love's strong fervor, that I cling to you forever. Oh, what blessing to be near you and to listen to your voice. Let me ever love and hear you. Let your word be now my choice. Many hardened sinners, Lord, flee in terror at your word. But to all who feel sin's burden, you give words of peace and pardon. Lord, your words are waters living when my thirsting spirit pleads. Lord, your words are bread life-giving. On your words my spirit feeds. Lord, your words will be my light through as cold and dreary night. Yes, they are my sword prevailing, and my cup of joy unfailing. As I pray, dear Jesus, hear me. Let your words in me take root. May your spirit ever be near me, that I bear abundant fruit. May I daily sing your praise, from my heart glad anthems raise, till my highest praise is given. In the endless joy of heaven. All right, we'll continue with the catechism memory work. What is the fourth commandment? <clears throat> Honor your father and mother. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. And uh, Bible memory work. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
and Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life would please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. All right. Um, what are y'all doing? Okay. So, uh, kids can go off to Sunday school then. And for the uh, hymn of the month, um, there's a couple things I was thinking about, and uh, maybe I'll save some of them for, for next week. We still have at least, yeah, one more Sunday in February. But a couple things I was thinking about when, I, when we were singing this. Um, the first is uh, from the first stanza at the, the last two lines there. Uh, Fill me, Lord, with love, strong fervor that I cling to you forever. And um, that idea goes very well with our epistle reading for today. So our epistle reading for today is from 1 Corinthians 13. Does anyone know what 1 Corinthians 13 is? It's the wedding passage uh, about love, right? Love is patient, love is kind, and so on and so forth. And... Um, and it, and it starts out, right, Paul starts out with this exhortation that about faith, hope, and love. You know, we could have all the faith and all the hope in the world. Um, we could have faith to move mountains, but if we don't have love, we don't have anything. And Jesus says, of course, that love, that, that's what everything boils down to. Love is the greatest commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't have those things, then... Um, that's what sin is, right? So all sin is really the lack of love because love is the summary of all the commandments. And love is also what Jesus embodied and fulfilled perfectly. So uh, this prayer, fill me, Lord, with love's strong fervor that I cling to you forever, uh, that's a prayer we should really pray every day, right? Um, I, I think praying for love to fill our hearts um, and 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 always also remembering like what what love truly is so love God with all your heart soul mind and strength okay what does that mean well that's summarizing the first three commandments not having other idols not misusing the name of the Lord which is Lord yeah living a living a Christian life right living according to our baptismal name and uh, remembering the Sabbath day which is which is keeping God's word sacred, yeah, and 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 um, of course, then everything that's included in that, as far as church attendance and things like that, right? So, um, so loving God in all those ways, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's the rest of the commandments, right? Um, and and we'll we'll talk about in a second honoring your father and your mother, and um, not murdering your brother uh, or hating him in your heart. And uh, the list the list goes on, right? Sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth commandments, coveting, all that. So that's that's what love is. And then kind of also like we talked about in the sermon last week, um, to to love someone else, to love your neighbor, is not our kind of modern American definition of love, which is to accept any action that they or thought that they may have, right? Um, so. We get this language now in our society of affirmation that we're supposed to affirm people and and everything that they think they are and think that they should do right and that's that's not what Christian love is. Christian love is um, living according to God's commands and sometimes love requires telling someone that they're wrong right Love requires calling someone else to repentance. Um, if I let people just go on in their sin, that would be unloving right? Because God wants them to repent. God wants them to come. So love, strong fervor, um, it doesn't, I think you could hear that, especially in our kind of modern world as a very like emotional thing. And, and often, you know, especially around like Valentine's Day, we think about love as um, 
in connection with romance, that's not purely what love is. Now, that's that's part of love, right? That's part of what love is, but um, that's not the only thing that, that love is. And love's strong fervor, um, it is... I, I like the, the adjective strong and the descriptor there of fervor because while it's not purely emotional, it is a very intense thing, right, if that makes sense. Um, I think about the hymn, Jesus, Thy Boundless Love to Me, uh, which is about Christ's love for us that motivated him to give up his life for the the sins of the world, um, which is... And, and the pain and suffering and the wrath, especially, that he bore for that. Um, that's a kind of love that is in, extremely intense in a certain way. And we're called to imitate that love. So um, I guess I'll leave the, the hymn at that. And we'll talk about maybe some of these other things next week. But that that just that little line is, is worth praying every day. Fill me, Lord, with love strong forever that I cling to you forever. Uh, that's a just a great little prayer that you can say. Um, back in the Middle Ages, there were books of one-line prayers. I can't remember what they're called, but um, the church has a history of using these like little one-line prayers. Uh, the Kyrie is probably the most famous, right? Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Um, but there were books in the Middle Ages. I don't have one, but I've heard that these exist where there were these collections of little prayers you could just take with you, right? And and say at, at certain times when you needed them. So uh, I should find one of those. Those are that would probably be good. Mm-hmm. But um, there's there's a really famous one called that's popular among Eastern Orthodox, I think, called the Jesus Prayer. It's like Jesus Son of God, have mercy on me, or something like that. Um, anyway. All right. Um, any questions or thoughts on, on love or on the hymn? In the uh, catechism, memory work for today, we have the fourth commandment. Honor your father and mother. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. There's a lot to say about this. Um, One thing that I'll point out is that if we're thinking about the commandments and uh, the two tables of the law, right, we have... Like we already discussed, we have 1 through 3 over here, which is about the love of God. And we have 4 through 10 on the second table, which is about the love of neighbor. Right, these are the two two tablets of stone, if you will, the two tables of the law. And number 4, the fourth commandment, um, as, as we'd label it, is the first of the second table. And I don't think that when God gave these commandments to Moses, he gave them in an arbitrary order, right? There's a reason we start with the first commandment because um, as we've discussed before, to break any commandment, to sin at all, is always to break the first commandment because to to break any commandment to sin against uh, God is to say that you think you know better than him, which is to make yourself an idol. And um, then things naturally, there's a natural flow to the commandments, if you will. Uh, The the order they go in simply makes sense. And so when we're kind of looking at this order, the chief commandment of loving your neighbor is the fourth commandment. And I think that's for... Uh, two reasons specifically that I'll, I'll point out, and I mean it's it's all connected, but um, two ways to talk about it. The first is that the connection of honoring your father and your mother is a direct reflection um, of the first commandment. So the first commandment is connected to the fourth commandment, because who is our heavenly father? God, right? 
God is our Heavenly Father. Uh, that is who he is. That is, by definition, who he is. And to honor our Heavenly Father, that is another way to say the fourth commandment, right? To honor your Father is that you shall have no other gods. And so we are called to honor our earthly fathers in the same way we're called to honor our Heavenly Father. Um, and, of course, then that extends to not just fathers, but to mothers as well. Honor your father and your and your mother. Um, but that relationship is uh, analogous, right, to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm. And um, I heard a pastor say once, um, I heard this a couple years ago, and and it, it's really it really stuck with me. It was at a pastor's conference, uh, and and he was saying when you counsel people and especially young people when they come in and they have problems in their life the first thing you should talk to them about is their relationship with their parents because someone's relationship with their parents and how they honor their father and their mother is going to tell you a lot about their life and this actually works pretty well i you know there of course there's exceptions to every rule but um we found the other basket. The basket was missing before. Oh, there is yeah. one. Yeah. We couldn't find that. Anyway, it's okay. No worries. Um, but this does this does work pretty well when you talk to people about what their relationship with their parents is like or was like. Um, you know, if their parents are past or whatever. Marsha, we didn't get didn't get our Um. That often tells you how how strong their faith in it, their faith is right and and uh what their uh the love's fervor is like right um if someone is absolutely rebellious toward their parents then they are often also rebellious toward god and um it, it's just very interesting uh even i have found that often oftentimes you'll get this question that um well what about parents who are bad parents and that there's a time, there is a time for basically what we could call like civil disobedience uh, toward parents whenever they, if, if parents are asking their children to sin, the children should rebel in that sense. They should disobey, right? Um, must serve God over men. But what's interesting is I've talked to a lot of good Christians who you, you know by their lives their faith is strong and when you, who grew up with, with bad parents, right? People whose parents are in jail for various reasons or parents who beat them, uh, parents who just were not good parents, right? And, and almost all the time when, they, when you talk to a, a strong Christian like this who had bad parents, you know, bad parents, they will still say, I still love them. I still strive to honor them as much as I can. I'll, I'll, stay in contact, I'll ask for advice that they might be able to give, I'll still cherish them, I'll still love them. Um, it's very interesting. You'd think that, you know, a lot of times people would just become estranged and, and say, I, I don't want anything to do with them. But very oftentimes, um, when you talk to a strong Christian who has, quote unquote, bad parents, they will still have this sense of honor for their, their parents, even though they're not good parents. And so, um, and seek to honor them in any way that they still can. So that it is very interesting how exactly analogous uh, the fourth and first commandment is. The second reason I would say that the first and fourth commandment are connected is, and the reason that the fourth commandment is the chief of the second table. And, the, and how the fourth commandment is kind of connected to everything else in the second table of the law is that the fourth commandment is, notice that Luther says parents and other authorities. The fourth commandment is all about um, what I like to call uh, ordered relationships. Ordered relationships. That our lives on this earth with other people are not meant to be chaotic. 
and we're not meant to be individuals, right? That's, that's kind of the preaching of, of modernity or modernism that uh, since the time of the Enlightenment that we're all unique individuals, um, we all live our own lives, we all control our own destiny. Um, goes back to Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Um, it's all about me, 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 me. And that is not how God created us. God created us not to be individuals, but to be in relationships with other people. When we're born into this world, this is the fourth commandment, everyone has a biological father and mother, right? Uh, no matter what you try and do to escape that, you can't escape the fact that at some point there was a sperm and an egg that were formed together in a womb to, um, to create human life. And that's a miracle of life. It's a miracle of God. But everyone has a biological father and mother. We are born into relationships. And that extends throughout our life to anyone uh, we meet. So that uh, you can think of all these different types of ordered relationships that exist um, when you think about the fourth commandment, parents and children, husbands and wives, uh, pastors and lay people, government and citizen, um, there's any uh, boss and employee, right? Any type of person you have a relationship with, there is supposed to be an order to that. Now, um, that's not to say that everything is like a one-way street where, um, you know, we're supposed, we're like slaves constantly throughout our lives. No, both, both saw, this is why I include Ephesians 6, 4 here, Everyone in an ordered relationship has commands of the Lord they need to follow, right? This is the table of duties um, that we'd, we've been through before, that um, no matter what your vocation is, no matter who you're in a relationship with, if you're the parent or if you're the child, you both have things that you are called to do by God. Um, if you're the parents, you're called to raise your ch- children in the discipline of the Lord and, and not to provoke them to anger. If you're children, you're called to honor and love and, and cherish your parents, right? So um, you can see there that there is both. It, there's a two-way street, um, and it's when that cycle gets going, when the parents are doing what they should and the children are doing what they should, it's a beautiful thing. Um, if that cycle gets broken, then uh, that is that makes things difficult, right? Because then the the more the parents provoke their children to anger, the more the children are tempted to not honor their father and mother, right? So you can get these good cycles or these bad cycles, but that's why God gives commands to both, right, um, parents and children, that we sh- that way we would um, be, want, when we read God's commands, we would be called to break that cycle, right, and, and turn it back into a good cycle. But... Regardless, the point is this, is that if you go through the rest of the commandments, right, so uh, the fifth commandment, the sixth commandment, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, all of them have to do with how you're behaving in ordered relationships that you're put in, right? All all of them do, right? Um, Because it all has to do with loving your neighbor. And, okay, so sixth commandment, um, that has to do with how husbands and wives love each other, right? Right? And that's an ordered relationship that we're put in. So that's, I think, why the those two reasons, um, the way that it's connected to the first commandment and then the way that it's connected to the rest of the commandments, those two reasons are why I think the fourth commandment is the chief of the second table of the law, if that makes sense. Any questions on any of that? Thoughts? Concerns? Okay. All right. Um, so... Moving on then, I um, actually have a decent amount of time to, to work with the, the Bible here today, which is good. We're going to pick back up in 2 Kings 11, 2 Kings 11, the story of Athelia.
So we're in 2 Kings 11 with the story of Athelia. And um, if you recall, uh, let's just see what's happened here. So um, Athelia took over the reign uh, after... Um, what was his name? Ahaziah. Ahaziah. Uh, and she killed off everyone that could possibly take the throne except for Joash, right? And Joash was saved by Jehoiada's, the Jehoiada the priest's wife, who was also the sister of Ahaziah, right? So, um, and Athelia is Jezebel's daughter, right? So Athelia is well-versed in wickedness, as we've been saying. And uh, she, you know, murdered all her own brothers and um, tried to, uh, and, and overtook the throne of Judah um, via a coup. And you can see the rampant wickedness that's been, been going on in Judah, right? And we talked about how Ahaziah was controlled by um, these people uh, over up in Israel that were that were overtly wicked, um, these wicked kings. But Jehoiada is faithful, and uh, what's uh, what's the sister's name? Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is faithful, and uh, they save Joash, Joash, and they they store away. Then um, we start talking about this last week. Jehoiada organizes a coup against Athelia, um, and first thing to note there is how politics and religion are interacting here. So um, Jehoiada is a priest, right? He's he's a Levite. He's a priest. And he's called to um, offer sacrifices, right? He's called to be a faithful priest in the, in the temple in uh, Jerusalem. And yet he gets very politically involved. Now, of course, we should say that Judah... And Israel is a very different situation than America today, um, politically and religiously. That those things are more inherently combined um, in Judah and Israel because God Himself established uh, this to be a Christian nation. But um, regardless, I think you can still see there that when there are times of overt unfaithfulness and overt sin, right, paganism, where Athelia is, um, you know, establishing Asherah and Ashtaroth, Baal worship, uh, you know, this Canaanite pagan worship that's got all sorts of terrible anti-Christian practices like child sacrifice and uh, homosexual uh, prostitution at, at the temple, all these things, right? All these terrible things. Then it is completely appropriate for the priest, the faithful priest, and as we see here, like the faithful lay people, these bodyguards that he brings in, uh, to fight against that. And uh, they even do it in a kind of clever way, right? So we get this command in Scripture to be uh, wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And so this is... I mean, it's it's almost um, comedic the way that Jehoiada does this um, in the way that, like in a movie, whenever there's a protagonist who does something really clever that you don't get to see until um, kind of the punchline against the antagonist um, and – that you know everything. If you like watch like a like a Mission Impossible movie or something like, or like a like a heist movie, you don't know how it all works together until the end, and then you see how it all fit together, and then you're like, ah, you're like yeah, he got him, you know. Um, that's kind of like what happens with with Jehoiada here, is that he organizes this coup, and then when Athelia comes in, she's like screaming her head off. So we'll we'll talk. I don't think we got there yet. So, um, but it, it it's almost comedic in the way that this happens. Uh, but it's but it's righteous, right? It's justice, 
And um, this is like when, so it, I, I don't know, I was just thinking about this, the, the kind of comedic nature of this. In Psalm 2, um, whenever the kings of the earth are plotting against the Lord and his anointed, so they're plotting against God and Jesus, against God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, it says, he who sits in the heavens, that's God the Father, laughs. Right? He's laughing at the kings of this earth who think they can plot against him. And he holds them in derision. Right? So um, it's a beautiful image to think about God and heaven laughing at people who think they're actually in control. Right? Um, whenever, whenever you get worried that someone evil or wicked is in control, just realize that God is up in heaven laughing at them um, because he's actually in control. Right? So anyway... Um, all right, so that, let's get to the story then. So Jehoiada, what he does is he brings in, um, this is like verse four, he brings in uh, hundreds of these bodyguards and, and escorts um, and captains into the house of the Lord, into the temple. And he talks to them and he makes them uh, swear a covenant. Um, and you know, if you notice here, he's kind of using his powers as a priest, right? Um, he's saying like, this is something we're gonna do like by the, by the Lord's command. Um, I need you to do this, right? Um, this is the, he's the high priest and he's going to, he's going to say what, what needs to be done for the priest. And he's not really even telling them exactly what they're doing this for. He's just calling them to the Lord's service. And he says, uh, one third of you, uh, when you come on duty for the Sabbath, will be keeping watch over the King's house. So that's something that would normally be done is that there would be, um, the Sabbath is a, is a busy day at the temple and there would be, um, these, kind of military men there keeping keeping order of things. Um, one third shall be at the gate uh, of Sir and one third at the gate behind the escorts. So basically they're going to close off the temple uh, with, with these very numerous people, right? Way more than they should normally need to be. But um, this is what they're going to do. And... Um, the two contingents of you who are off duty, uh, they're going to be there at the Sabbath keeping watch over the house of the Lord anyway. So basically there was like three groups of people. There was um, kind of a th third that should normally be there and then two thirds that wouldn't normally be there, but they're going to be there, right? Um, every And you're going to surround, uh, there's going to be the king. He just says the king, uh, which is interesting. He doesn't say who it is because right now there's actually a, Queen in power, um, but the the king is going to be there, um, and every man with his weapons in his hands is going to need to need to be there. Okay, so he organizes all these people. We're kind of at verse uh, nine now, and um, then verse ten is very interesting. He gave to them the spears and shields which had belonged to King David, right? So this is a very symbolic gesture that they're taking up the mantle, if you will, of David, right? If you think back about 2 Samuel 7, uh, the God is going to establish a kingdom forever out of the house of David. Um, and obviously, Athelia is not fulfilling that prophecy, right? Um, she's not the, the Messiah. She's not the anointed one. She's not the king forever. But they take up David's sword and shields, right? Uh, his spears and shields, and that that were in the temple of the Lord. And it's it's also symbolic, right? That um, whenever you get these evil kings in Judah and Israel's history, is that there are things that get left behind and start to collect dust. So eventually, we'll get to the story of Hilkiah and. Um, When he, when, when Hilkiah the priest finds the book of the law collecting dust in the temple, right? Um, but this is kind of a common thing that there are things in the temple just like collecting dust whenever there's because these wicked kings and this wicked queen is out building idols and uh, and doing idol worship and they're not in the temple where they should be, right? And it's also one of the reasons that Jehida is actually able to. Um, organize this coup, right? Because if Athelia was there like worshiping 
the Lord like she should be and listening to the priest, then this wouldn't be able to happen. But um, that's not what's going on, right? So um, anyway, he, so he gave him the things and uh, they they all – so the Sabbath came and they all stood around him and he brought out the king's son, Joash, right, who had been hidden away, um, who had you know supposedly been living with Jehoiada and Jehosheba, right? Um, they had been basically his foster parents. And he brought him out, and then he started uh, basically rallying up the crowd, right? Um, he, they, they started chanting um, and clapping their hands and, and shouting, long live the king, long live the king. And so you can kind of imagine this, right? You got these hundreds of military men all like crammed surrounding the temple. And if, if you remember when we talked about Solomon's temple uh, a long time ago, um, it's really not that big. Like it's kind of about like the size of like our sanctuary, right? It's a, it's extravagant, it's elegant, it's um, reverent, and it's beautiful. Cedars of Lebanon, all this beautiful things were brought in to build it, but the actual overall size is not humongous. So you got hundreds of people crammed around this, this temple and um jehiada goes into the middle of the temple with joash the seven-year-old he's seven years old at this point and they start he anoints him so he uh brings out the king and anoints him and this is part how a king is coronated right if you actually we're gonna i'm preaching on this today in uh first samuel 16 that uh, when David is anointed by Samuel, uh, that uh, he d- when he call, calls out all of Jesse's sons and none of them are the one that the Lord chose, and then he calls in David and anoints him with oil, um, and the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him. This is how kings are coronated, is with the anointing of oil. So um, he brought out the king's son, put the crown, it's verse 12, put the crown on him, gave him the testimony, and uh, made him king and anointed him. And then they all started shouting, long live the king. Okay, so just imagine that that scene. It's kind of incredible. Yeah. So the testimony is a copy of the law, the book of the Bible? Or? Yeah, I think so. Uh, let me check the, the cross-reference there to be sure. I just kind of noticed that and was like, oh, yeah, what is that? Um, I, yeah, it says law in my footnote. I mean, yeah. Well, that would just be the six. Hmm. Yeah. Um. I. I. Yeah. I think it would. It would be the. The. That's my guess. I'd have to look that up. Um. To be sure. But. But I think it is the law. The book of the law, probably. Uh, 2 Kings 11, verse 12. Gave him the testimony. Yeah, it's probably... Yeah, my guess is it's the word Torah. Um, copy of the law. This version says a copy of the covenant. Yeah. The covenant? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it it uh, in that case it it could be anything. Maybe it's a copy of like second um second Samuel seven or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's a, some sort of seems document, right? Um, I'd have to do some more research on that. I haven't I haven't looked it up exactly, but uh, some sort of binding document, I would guess, right? But that's interesting. So anyhow, um, Athelia then, of course, she lives around the temple, right? So the king's house is um, by the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, she heard the noise uh, coming from this. And she went and looked. And uh, there was a king, this is verse 14, standing by a pillar according to the custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. 
and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Okay, so the queen who has, right, thought that she has won, right? She, she thought that she killed off everyone. She, uh, she thought she was set to go, right, as, as the, the queen of the land. And she's also used to getting her way, right? She controlled Ahaziah when he was king. And um, just like Jezebel, right, she is very used to getting her way about things. So she gets very upset and she t- tears her clothes. This is verse uh, 14 and shouts, treason, treason. Okay. This is comedic because she's the one who committed treason, right? Um, in the first place. But I want you to notice something here, which is that, um, I mean, it's a, it is a funny irony, but what it shows you is that enemies of the gospel, they do believe in their own delusions. Um, I, I think, you know, sometimes when we think about wicked people, we think, surely they must know what they're doing is wicked. And maybe they're doing it for money. Maybe they're doing it for fame, right? What, whatever. Um, uh, but some, sometimes, oftentimes, I think wicked people really think what they're doing is right, right? Uh, pe- people really will buy into their worldviews in a certain way, right? Um, I think... Go back to Sunday school. Um, I, I think very often uh, we want to attribute the best to people. We want to put the best construction on things, and that's all great. But but sometimes people really do believe that what they're doing, as kind of messed up in their head as it is, is right. And that has a lot of applications with it. I think one of the main ones would be that when we interact with people who are not Christians, um, especially in today's world, it would be easy to like think there's nothing we can do with them, right? There's there's no way that they could ever come around. There's you know if you if if you think about like um, your most kind of like insane anti-Christian version of a modern person, so. Um, someone who has pronouns that they mandate that you call them and that um, you can't even tell what biological sex they are because they're trying to not be any, they're trying to be non-binary or whatever. Um, And they think that you're ruining the world because you're driving a gas powered engine and um, (laughs) like basically, you know, think of like the most insane person you can think of that you might encounter on the streets. And um, you might think like, I mean, there's no way they believe all this, right? Well, they might. I mean, that's their, that's their worldview. And the, the reason I bring this up is because we should not, I think, treat them as if they're insane right? Um, We should treat them as people who are obviously lost in their delusions, but we should treat them with a certain kind of love, recognizing that they have a way that they have fit the world together in their own own brain. And um, it takes a lot of patience, obviously, um, to to work through these things, um, but to recognize that these things are not like so completely random and delusional that that they would actually, you know, there's like, oh, there's no way that this is actually even like real or like that this person's even worth my time. Like as far gone as someone is in their own delusions, they are still a human and they are still forgiven by the blood of Christ. Um, and they are still capable of, of faith, right? That Jesus died for the sins of the world, um, including the sins which seem absolutely insane to us that we might not never be tempted by, but other people are. So anyway, um, 
it's it is worth noting that some people will actually believe in their own. I mean, I think if, my point is, Athelia here really thinks that there is treason going on. Um, when you read the story, that seems hilarious, but uh, she really does think there is. So anyway, all right. Um, so then Athelia is put to death for treason, which is good, right, and salutary. And um, faithfulness starts to abound. So in, in verse 17, um, Jehida made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people that they should be the Lord's people. And between the king and the people and all the people of the land uh, went to the temple of Bel and tore it down. They thoroughly broke it in pieces, its altars, its images, and uh, killed Matan, the priest of Bel, before the altars. Um, and the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. And he took captains of the hundreds of the bodyguards and the escorts and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and went by the way of the gate to the king's house. And they sat. then he sat on the throne of the kings. Just imagine this. They're marching the seven-year-old down. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, but it's, but they're, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful thing because it's restoring the covenant that, that God made with David. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the land rejoiced and the city was quiet. Right. I, I always like it when you get this description of of a good political life is that a good a good life in a place where you live is a quiet and peaceful life. Right. That's really all we want is uh, it, it as far as like politics goes is we just want peace and quiet <laughs> so that we can preach the gospel. Right. That's what we want. Um, and the land was quiet. And they had slain Athelia with the sword in the king's house. Joash, Jehoash was, sometimes he's Joash, sometimes he's Jehoash. We're familiar with this concept. Was uh, seven years old when he became king. Okay. Uh, so that gets us to the to the story of Joash. Um, and uh, just a couple things I'd point out about that whole story there is that that was a uh, that's an example of good civil disobedience. Right, where the church gets involved in politics because they're called to disobey the government for a good reason. Um, and the second thing is that one of the things we talked about with Athelia and with Ahaziah is the problem of bad company, that it was bad company that corrupted good morals. And that is a cycle that goes on um, where the bad company produces bad morals and the bad morals produce bad company. And what Jehoiada does is he breaks the cycle. He breaks the cycle by saving the rightful king, by practicing good civil disobedience, and by being faithful to the Lord. And um, so that's something worth imitating is whenever there's someone that you have a relationship with, that is in a bad cycle of bad company and bad morals, um, think about ways that you can help break that cycle because that's that's how these problems get solved. And we'll see how that plays out with Joash in his life. Um, and when Jehoiada, his good company, uh, leaves him um, by, way of, by way of death and old age, uh, Joash, unfortunately... Uh, falls back into the cycle of his of his parents and grandparents. Um, but there is going to be a time of blessing when he's not in that bad cycle. So Joash is going to, when we talk about Joash, he's going to start out a very good king, and he's going to end up an evil king. But um, the way that that plays out is based around the company that he keeps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jehoiada counsels him his whole life until Jehoiada dies. So, um, so we'll talk about that um, next week. I don't really want to start because we only got three minutes left. Um, one thing I'll talk about, if you want me to, really quickly is uh, so. What's interesting is you could call what happens um, in Second Kings 11 there a revival of sorts. And um, if you're on the internet, um, no, a couple of us here are on the internet. Um, if you're not on the internet, then Blessed are, are you, um, because your life is probably a lot simpler. But there's a um, there's this revival that's supposedly going on right now 
at Asbury Seminary in um, Kentucky. It's a Methodist seminary. And um, it was even on the news. Like, I think Tucker Carlson covered it some Mm -hmm. on Fox News. But basically, there was a chapel service that someone stood up and gave a testimony, and then the chapel then everyone felt the spirit and the chapel service hasn't ended since then. Last I checked, it hasn't ended. Um, and they've been worshiping basically 24 seven and, um, people were driving down from all over the country because there's a Christian revival going on, uh, starting at this Asbury seminary in, in Kentucky. Um, and I would say that, there's a couple things to think about this. So, so, so basically, when something like this happens, uh, there's two question or kind of two sides. One is, is this a if this is a real revival, then we would say, hey, you know, the Reformation happened. We're we're all about reform and revival as as Lutherans, and 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 we want um, people to repent of their sins and, and come to Christ and, and, and live. And, um, you know, that's great and everything. The other side of us would say that the church on earth has struggled before with this thing called enthusiasm, uh, which is basically when people get caught up in their emotions and, um, start to trust in their emotions, thinking that it's the Holy Spirit when really it's just their own emotions and um, there's not actually kind of anything real going on. And so we got to, basically we need to test the spirits and we need to discern, okay, like what is actually going on here? And it's it's hard to know um, having not been there, but it a revival is also hard to, to know when it's real or not because the, what, what happens with a revival, if you look at revivals in history or reformations in history, like in 2 Kings 11 or in other places in the Bible, like with Hilkiah, um, is that things tangibly change in that place. Um, or if you think about like Jonah, when Jonah, there's a revival in Nineveh. And generally the things that change are matters of public sin and corporate sin. So when a place um, like Nineveh struggles with paganism, they repent of their paganism and they stop, right? Or when uh, Judah struggles with Baal worship, they go and they tear down the temple of Baal and they kill that priest. What we see happening in Asbury, um, the couple like testimonies I've watched online and stuff, is people are repenting. But they're not repenting of like public sin. They're repenting of individual sin. And oftentimes they're not even really repenting of individual sin. They're saying things like the spirit of depression that that made me suffer has been cast out, which from a Christian framework, we would say that's not really how we talk about sin. Sin is something that's your problem that you've done against God and you need to repent of. It's not some spirit that was forced upon you and that then another spirit cast out. That's a weird way to say things. So um, I would say that initially makes me not really – that makes me think it's more enthusiasm than it is a real revival. But the real tell will just be down the line. Um, Do – does that place in Kentucky, does that area start to um, publicly repent of of big public sins? So for instance – um, that seminary is pro women's ordination. Are they going to stop that? Are they going to stop teaching that? Okay, like that would be a sign that a real revival might have taken place, right? Because there's a public action towards public repentance. So, anyway, um, that's what that's what I would say about that. Is that um, hey, I'm all for a revival. I'm all for a reformation and revival. Um, not revival in the sense of like a tent. Revival, like the Second Great Awakening or whatever. I don't really think um, that's what we need to, to be doing. But um, I'm all for people coming together and reading the Word of God and publicly repenting of their sins. I mean, that happens all the time in the Bible. Um, we know that from going through the Kings. But, uh, 
Yeah, and well, it does. <laughs> but the real the real telltale sign is a big a show of public repentance, and um, in in truly like in a sense political action oftentimes. Sure. So that's what I would look for, but I don't think that's I'd be surprised to see that at, out of Asbury. Yeah. I have a so this is usually what you see in the, in the Bible as far as a revival going on is you see a place that is completely you know it's if there's any Christianity left in it it's a smoldering wick and it's completely totally debased and it's so like America yeah, <laughs> like, but, yeah. But, okay. But Maybe we have more than a small language. This is supposed to be this is Asbury. It's supposed to be a seminary. So it shouldn't be that debased in in, in pagan worship right. and all that stuff to start with in order for a revival to be necessary. Part two, I don't have a problem with seeing especially college kids repenting of their sins and stuff like that and right. the preaching of the law. I watched a video on it, and there didn't seem to be any gospel preached. There was a lot of preaching of the law, you know, do this, don't do that. And yeah, it's, it's also just really hard to tell because there's, it's go, it's been going on for days and days and days and days, 24/7. So, and people like random people are just getting up and saying stuff. Yep. Right. So who knows, you know, like what they're saying. You have these people from the NAR that are mm. trying to glom onto this thing. You right. Know? Of course, of course they do. Anytime you have the possibility right. that something's good happening, these these are For those who don't know, NAR is a kind of a church body type thing, where they believe that um, their whole like structure of belief is based around the concept of revival, that the church needs to be governed by these modern apostles that are going to rise up and and cause revival in our land. So that's. I can't even remember what it stands for. It's like something apostle, something new, apostolic apostolic new yeah, new apostolic reformation. Thank you. But these people are, yeah. glom, are glom onto it. And of course, they're they're a bunch of phonies anyway. They're false prophets and abusers of scripture. They're horrible people. But you know, when they try to co-op. <laughs> Tell me what you really think. Well, yeah. <laughs> you got an hour. <laughs> well, I mean, they're profiteers. Sure, they're, sure. They're Bible profiteers. They twist the scripture to make profit off of people. Right. And uh, and so, uh, of course, they're going to try to co-opt this thing and move into it. And <clears throat> then people were driving from miles and miles and miles away. Mm-hmm. And so you don't know if if something good was happening and now it's being <clears throat> right you know yeah with yeah i would say we just need to wait and see cuz the telltale sign is going to be uh <clears throat> what what public repentance actually happens what what what, com- what fruit comes of it right good fruit comes from a good tree so we'll see what fruit comes of it um and i you know if there are people actually being affected by the word of god that's great um you know otherwise you know, we'll just uh, keep it in our prayers and and see what fruit comes of it. But let's uh let's close with a word of prayer. All right, we got to get ready for church here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for raising up faithful priests and prophets and kings for your people throughout the history of your church, and especially for raising up and sending your Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is our prophet, priest, and king, and who is the perfect prophet, priest, and king, who came and ruled over us and took on our sins, and died with them on the cross. We pray that the word of God would be preached in our land and that people would repent of their sins and turn to you alone. We pray all of this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Seems like... Yes, Asbury has had um, revivals before, and this is another thing that – it's not like it can't be real just because of this, but um, it's, it's almost like you had they've, – they, they've tried this multiple times, and then this one catches on to social media. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't know. It's. Yeah, we don't want to read the Holy Spirit, but we do want to be cautious. Yeah. Every, every so I'd say, yeah, just test day. test the spirits and, uh, you know, see what fruit comes of it. But, but the thing is, is you don't 